He's Henry Gomez, an ad agency strategist with 25 years of experience. And he's Howard Eibach, a former copywriter and creative director and the author of two books on the creative brief. And together we're the Brief Brothers, having an ongoing discussion about creative briefs, briefing and advertising. So today, Howard, we have a very special guest. His name is Greg Benedict. He is someone uh, who I follow on LinkedIn, and he is a uh, freelance copywriter, creative director, and also a professor of advertising, adjunct professor. And what drew us to him was an ongoing series of posts about brilliant advertising, and we had a really great conversation with him. So let's take a look. Sounds good. So we're joined today by Greg Benedict, um, who both Howard and I follow on LinkedIn. Uh, Greg has a series of posts about great advertising of years past um, and being old fogies ourselves that uh, are uh, really in love with the industry of advertising and the history of advertising we thought this is a guy we want to have on the brief brothers so welcome greg benedict uh can you tell us a little bit about your background and how it is that you came to be the the guy who celebrates great advertising from yesteryear uh wow thanks for having me so i don't know where to begin all this but um I wasn't in ad, you know, like a great many people growing up, I loved commercials and I'd watch commercials all the time, but I didn't know what a copywriter was. And I was an English major at the University of Delaware, actually with a journalism background, but, or a journalism minor, but I never wanted to write for the paper. And I came back home to New York. I'm from Brooklyn. And I remember calling up agencies, right? And I knew nothing about advertising. And I called up agencies and I said, I want to be in your creative department. And someone said, do you have a portfolio? <laughs> now, I plead complete ignorance, knew nothing. And I said, someday I'll have one, right? I knew nothing about a student portfolio. And someone said, go take classes at School of Visual Arts. It's taught by professionals. And I was young and ignorant and said, I'm never taking another class. I graduated on time with 135 credits and I'm done with schooling. And I called up Ogilvy. I, I called up, someone picked up the phone. Hello, Ogilvy and May there. I said, creative. And I get transferred to creative and some guy picks up the phone. And I said, I want to be in your creative department. And he said, do you have a book? Do I have a book? I'm from Brooklyn. I thought he was being a wise guy. I said, <laughs> I have a dictionary at home. <laughs> sorry, hung up on me. Just clicked. So I call up someone. I go, what's a book? A book's a portfolio, right? I don't know. So long story short, I took night classes at School of Visual Arts with this dream that I could be in the business and... 30 years later, I'm in the business. I've been teaching now at School of Visual Arts for 20 years. Uh, it's been a dream come true. I it, literally, I sat in class dreaming about what my life would be, and it turned out to this. So, and I tell my students, if I could do it, you could do it. Is it hard? You f in bed, it's hard, but it should be hard. It should be hard to make your dreams come true. Yeah, I noticed on your LinkedIn profile, Greg, that you had said, and Get, correct me if I'm wrong, you had said something to the effect that, you know, when someone asks me, what is the dream job? You said, you, you tell people that you work in advertising as a copywriter, and they say, well, what if you could do anything you wanted, what would you do? You said, I'd be a creative director in advertising. That's it, right? There, there are so many people who want out of this business. I still yeah. love this business. I love this. If you could, someone said to me, you could do anything you want, I'd be a creative in advertising. Well, it certainly beats real work, um, <laughs> I, I, I think. You know, I've been my 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 story is similar to yours. I, I actually went when I graduated college, it was in 1991 and there was a, a recession on and there weren't a lot of employers looking for people. So I ended up working at Walmart stores uh, in their manager training program. I was an assistant manager trainee in a hundred and fourteen thousand square foot Walmart store. And then um, I had an opportunity to buy a sports gift shop franchise um, and I borrowed money and I did that. And then I had some personal setbacks, a relationship that failed, uh, my business failed and I got sick. 
And I decided I was going to go back to school and become a history teacher, took some courses that I needed to, in order to, to, to teach history. And a buddy of mine called me up. He was working in an ad agency and he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm waiting to interview for schools for the next academic year. He said, well, why don't you come help us out temporarily at the ad agency? We're always looking for smart people, which I took that as a compliment. And uh, I, I walked into an ad agency the first day without ha ever having contemplated what went on inside an ad agency. And here we are, you know, 25 plus years later. So, um, it, and it was funny because in the beginning, I, I didn't consider myself an advertising person. It took probably six or seven years for me to finally come to peace with the fact that this is the industry I'm, I'm in and I'm probably in it for the long haul. And, and here we are. So I always like to hear people's stories of how they got into advertising in the first place. Yeah, it's pretty fascinating. And, you know, even with our students, I say art because I teach with my old art partner, um, their backgrounds, people come in from all sorts of, and, you know, I tell my class, the only thing that matters is your portfolio. No one's ever asked me what my GPA was. Delaware yeah. might come up is a little conversation, but it's, a, it's about the work in your book. And it's always about the work, the work, the work, the work will get you your next job. Uh, and, you know, talking about what I post, I'm really melancholy about how I think the work was so much better 20, 25 years ago. Um, and for years, I would post on LinkedIn. I would just post an article or people would send me things or an old commercial. And about a year ago, something reminded me of a Citibank ad, um, which I thought the Citibank Live Richly campaign done at Fallon is my favorite campaign of all time. And I'm gonna read you, it was just an ad, and it said, money can't buy happiness, but it can buy marshmallows, which are kind of like the same thing. <laughs> and what made me that day, I just wrote, instead of just posting it, and I had posted ads before, but that day, about a year ago, I wrote, oh, brilliant advertising, how I miss you so, and I just posted this. And it got like 10,000 views. And the next day, I don't know why, right? We, we don't know how our brain works. It was never my intention. I thought of another ad and I wrote, oh, brilliant advertising, how I miss you so, part two. And then part three, and every day became a new post. And today's post was 290 or 295. So I posted an ad from yesteryear or an old commercial usually more than 20 years old, sometimes from the 60s, 50 years old. Um, and it's ads, they're, they're being shared around the world. I'm getting comments from people in India. I'm getting comments from people in London. Uh, I'm getting people who knew who did it because I don't know who did these. I find them online. I remember an ad that I saw or an ad for, you know, a Swiss army knife that was genius. And then People start talking about, oh, that was done at this agency, or that agency was so great. Um, it's really taken on a life of its own, and it's been a lot of fun. Greg, is this, is this a, a, um, simply an acknowledgement of some great advertising from years gone by, or are you, are you really saying that things are not as good as they used to be, or is it a little bit of both? I'm sure it's a little bit of both. I don't think the ads are as good. I think looking at commercials, looking at everything, you know, George Lois, who I love his quotes. And I think George Lois is a, is a, is a crazy, he'll say he's crazy. The big idea. Uh, I met him when I was a young junior. He has a quote that says, you know, we're in the creative business, not the technology business. And I think he mm -hmm. uses the F word in his, in his quote somewhere. Um, I, I think the, the ideas are not there anymore. Even looking at Super Bowl spots, they're not as good as they were 20 years ago. And I, I don't know why. And, you know, print ads or print ads or even just statements, right? People say print is dead. I don't buy that print is dead. But you could have a statement on an Instagram page. You could have a statement as, you know, the Citibank campaign with just these most provocative statements you've ever seen. Most were just copy. Later on, the campaign developed into 
a picture with the visual with the copy but they were just statements that were just so unbelievable um and speak about the city campaign if you can find this online live richly uh they put together this book justice fallon of just all the amazing amazing ads and one page after the next it's just brilliant and brilliant and brilliant you you know you bring up an interesting point which is we that work in the industry and work on these clients and these accounts we put our heart and soul in, into the into the work for society the work is very disposable right like advertising is literally within the entertainment kind of and it is entertainment i do believe that and we've we've had paul feldwick on on the podcast um it's probably the most disposable form of of entertainment it's here today it's gone tomorrow um and there, to me, there's something sad about that because there is these brilliant pieces of work that really stimulate thinking in the person who's reading or viewing uh, the work. And I, and I find it sad that, you know, these legendary people like, you know, we just lost Cliff Friedman uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, that it's just in the ether and it's gone. And so I, I think that's one of the reasons people are attracted to your posts is, you know, every one of these ads, a, a good ad has a story behind it and how it got made and sometimes how it got made against the odds or how hard it was to sell through or how hard it was to produce. And uh, I think all of us that are in the trenches in advertising appreciate those stories and, and wish that, our work could somehow be immortal like that. You know, and I think it's it's the perfect storm now of work, great work not being celebrated. I think there are a younger generation of creative directors who don't know how to push the work, who don't, they may know technology, they may know how this is gonna flip on a mobile phone, but but what's the idea, right? What's the idea? You know, in in our class, everything's done with a black magic marker and a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. Don't have an idea with a Sharpie. Photoshop is not a concept. I don't care what filter you're gonna put on it. I don't care what's gonna happen and this is gonna, ex that's not an idea. That's not yeah. an idea. And I also think clients, I, you know, it, it's a, it's a two way street, you know, I, remember back in the day having great clients who would say bring me something that's going to scare me that's the greatest client in the world you know now partly i think clients are some clients are afraid of their jobs they don't want to push the envelope they're happy doing very average mediocre work and you know how did it test who cares truly who cares how it tested yeah um, you know in the 90s i took a workshop an ad week workshop with um, uh, Steph, uh what's his name? He was he was Hill Holiday, uh, Hill Holiday, the Greek. Say it again. Hill Holiday, Connors Cosmopolis. Cosmopolis with I, what's his? I can't remember his first name, but Cosmopolis taught the workshop, and I think I still have it here somewhere. Um, it's a former employer of mine, by the way. I worked yeah. at Hill Holiday for four yeah. years. I still, I still have these little book booklets that he he gave us. Make your layouts rough and your ideas fancy. Of course, this was back in the day, before computers. You know, the other one was this is these are just little black and white things where he he did he did the art direction himself. This one's called That's My Brontosaurus Leg, and it's all about you know writing copy. You know, he 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 was one of those guys who said it's about the idea. And, you know, to your point, we today and we were talking about a, a 40 minute talk that Dave Trott gave some weeks ago where he was essentially sharing the, the best and the brightest, the best history of advertising from the 60s on and lamented the fact that it's that creatives today are leaning too heavily on technology and gimmicks rather than on on ideas. Um, you know that I teach creative brief writing. And one of the things that I've encountered when I travel around the country or even virtually these days is how few creatives or marketers for brands that have been around forever know anything about their brands more than five years ago. They just are ignorant of their own, the brand's own history. So how can, how can they have any sense of what's good if they don't know anything about 
what came, you know, within the lifetime of their careers. Plus, plus, uh, uh, yes, and Howard, if 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 advertising is storytelling, and storytelling is a big buzzword that has been thrown around. In fact, on my LinkedIn, I say I've been using storytelling and advertising since before it was a buzzword. Right. Um, if 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 advertising is storytelling, if you don't know what was in the opening chapters of the story, how are you going to continue telling the story to a new or to the audience? It doesn't make any sense. And I've always said, you know, that big advertisers should have a brand historian uh, right. on staff um, that not only is a historian in terms of, oh, has an archive of all these old ads, but is a marketer and that can explain, this was the strategy behind this ad and this is how it worked. And this is what we found didn't work. And so that the people that are currently in charge of a brand could understand where the brand has been and so that they have a better idea of where the brand should go in terms right. of telling a story to to consumers. Right. So I, yeah, I, you know, and, and Greg, you, you mentioned something that to me, and I know that it's an easy cop out for an agency person to lay the blame at the client's feet, but in reality, there's nobody else to put the blame at. Who approves and pays for the advertising? The client does. And if if they're putting out crappy advertising, it's because they hired a crappy agency or they didn't allow the agency to do good work and they approved crappy advertising. Um, and I think that risk aversion is definitely the the big cause of that. I I tongue-in-cheek posted something on LinkedIn a few months ago that said, the average agency person wants to win a lion at Ken. The average client wants to send his kids to college. Yeah. It's two very there, different goals. Right. There are very few, right, I would say under 10 agencies that would just stand and say, we're not doing anything mediocre. You know, years ago, um, can I talk about clients? You can't talk about clients. You can talk about whatever you want to do. This is yeah. a free country still. So, I think. It worked for Facebook. Fallon had the Nikon account, and they like Nikon wanted something so pedestrian that Fallon refused to like. We're Fallon, and we're not. We're not doing it. We're like refused to whatever that you know, and you know they ended up something that was so average and so not found like Fallon refused to do this ad they found someone else to do it and then they you know they were you know changing agencies anyway and I don't know if it was the marketing director but right there were very few agencies right everyone because agencies still right you have to pay people and you have to pay this and we'll fight for you know why didn't Kennedy we just lost Kennedy this weekend did you know that yes yeah. so yeah. put Freeman and people and um yeah, oh, so great, so legends of business. It, it's a great example because Nikon, I mean, if you think about that industry, right? Like, is, is there a more respected and, and important brand than Nikon? I mean, you could argue that there are, but it's an incredibly important brand within photography. And why would they settle for crappy advertising? If you're Nikon... They, they used to be at Amirati and Fallon and this, and the, the, the stuff now is just so very average for Nikon, which was the leader, is the leader. I don't even know anymore. Yes. Um, yeah. Greg, you make a really good point that there may, there may be, and you just made this number up, I think, there might be 10 agencies who can put their foot down and say no. Henry likes to talk about the bell curve, and I, you know, I agree with, when, with, with him when he makes this point. There's always going to be at the far end, the very elite shops that can do the very best work. The other end, there's just the absolute crap. And then in the middle, there's the rest of us, the ones that are doing the average run of the mill stuff that pays the bills, that sells the stuff, that's retail stuff. My question is, has that bell curve changed all that much in the last in 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago? There's still, has that number 10 uh, elite agencies increased or decreased in the last 40, 50 years? I think it was more, I think creative was more lauded years ago. I think everyone thinks because they have a computer or they have programs that they're a creative or Fiverr, right? I'm gonna pay $100,000 for a logo. I could go on Fiverr, I get a logo of $5, right? So people don't understand the thought that goes behind that. Um, 
I think creative agencies had more power pre-2000, from the 60s to 2000. Now they're thought of as a vendor. I don't think people, you know, there, there are a few true partnerships, certainly Nike and Wyden and Kennedy, and I'm sure Goodby has partnerships, and I'm sure Shia Day has partnerships. Um, they're not anymore, you know, and it's your who's going to do it cheaper, who's going to do it this. Um, so what I, do you, blame, what? I blame Martin Sorrell. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, even even in the pharma world, there are some really, really brilliant pharmaceutical ads that have to get through legal and regulatory and the government. I mean, one of my favorite ones, it could be in the last 20 years, and it was for one of these. Uh, I hope I don't get the drug wrong, but to go to sleep drug. Right. And the whole idea was your dreams miss you. Right. And it had Abe Lincoln. And I think it was like a beaver. Like, I want to meet the team. Like, how would you come up with Abe Lincoln and a beaver? As you, but the whole idea of your dreams miss you is genius, is genius. And take this and get back to your dreams because they miss you. Uh, but I even think the pharmaceutical stuff, like two out of every 100, maybe five are really, really big ideas. And the other 95 percent is just. Yeah, I, I spent two years in the in the pharma business and the regulatory hoops that you have to jump through, plus the mentality of the physicians who are scared of anything, because everything has got to be it's safe and it's efficacious. And beyond that, it's a risk that I'm not willing to take. It's a it's a tough it's a tough market. Really, I tough. think I think there's a, a big underestimation of the target audiences as well. Right. Because what you're talking about, Greg, is like see and say advertising It's like, oh, your stomach is bloated. Therefore, you need this product that and everything is very see and say and rationally based. And right. it doesn't respect the audience's ability to understand something conceptually. And when you're in a highly regulated industry like pharma, that that just gets, but it, it happens in all industries. Right, but you, 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 you make the audience, right? The audience is not as stupid as you think they are, right? Mm -hmm. And even though, right, I've done pharma, I think everyone in the business has touched it. Like one time you had a right to a sixth grade level because that's what the, the regulatory was, not, but, but it had to be, you know, sentences couldn't be compound and you couldn't have three syllable words. And it was just it was mind boggling. Um, but when an ad is done right and it gives you that aha moment, I was just talking about this with someone. Oil of Olay did an ad could be 20 years ago, could be longer. It was just a two word headline. Talk tick. Talk tick. <laughs> I love it. And you're laughing. Talk, that's it. Yep. It say right. The, it didn't say it'll reverse the hands of time, right? That would have been the bad line that a client would have bought, I'm sure. Like, oh, yeah. It'll revert top. Let someone, oh, oh, I get it. Wow, right. And you say it, right? I use that example in my class, and people, it gives them a second. And then you should see the smile. It's just advertising, right? But it's entertainment. Yeah. And when done the right way, you don't forget it. Now, we, I, we, I, we, I, I, We've talked about that a bit and we talk about like not completing the circle for consumers. Let them complete the circle. In fact, yeah. when you do that, when they finish the ad in their mind or they finish the thought, you're making them a stakeholder in it all of a sudden. They're in on it and it, it's much more powerful. It's an easier way to break through and you create sympathy or empathy for the brand because we're now we're all in on it together. Like we got this joke together. Right. It's an aha moment. I mean, people, we take it for granted what Wyden and Kennedy did with Nike, but it was revolutionary. A sneaker. They didn't talk about the sole. They didn't talk about the stitching. They didn't talk about the product of the sneaker. They talked about you. Just do it. It was ahead of its time. It was ahead of its time that people were like, wow, even Volvo talking about how safe cars were in the 60s was revolutionary. You know, it's funny, years ago too, I, I, I did something for Saab before, I think Saab, the, I think the brand is gone these days, but Saab was actually a safer car, but nobody would believe it because Volvo owned that. They owned right. 
Um, and it was ahead of its time talking about what you're talking about. That's um, another, that's another, I think, important thing that gets lost or it doesn't get lost to me, but I think to a lot of clients, which is n not only the importance of having a, a message that's motivating and, and that breaks through, like just do it, but to be consistent and stay with it. There's such as an aversion to staying with a formula that works these days. I don't know, we, uh, Howard and I lament it all, all, all the time. Uh, you know, his favorite example is Lexus. You know, um, th they walked away from, you know, a, a positioning and a, and a tagline that is probably the most desirable thing that, that you would want in a vehicle, which is the pursuit of excellence, right? Yeah, or, yeah the relentless or, pursuit of perfection was the line that, that uh, um, Tom Cordner wrote, and he was an art director. I went to work for Tom Cordner, and they kept that line for a long time, and now they've abandoned it completely. But that's not that, the first brand to do that. Of course not. But the, but the point is, it, it's not a, every brand that can actually live up to something a promise like that, right? But Lexus, we all know, is very good manufacturer of automobiles, high quality automobiles, whether you like them aesthetically or not. And I don't like them. My dad's a Lexus guy, but you have to begrudgingly acknowledge these are pretty much the most bulletproof cars that are around. And so when they say uh, relentless pursuit of perfection, it's kind of easy to believe it for them. And just like with the Volvo and the, and the safety thing, and then to stick with that consistently and not get bored with it as a marketer, as a client, I think it's it's a hard thing to do. I, we're, we're seeing that it's a hard thing to do. And to me, that's the biggest waste of money that I see a lot of advertisers is abandoning things that have worked and not being creative enough to realize how do we take this longstanding platform and make it fresh, right. but still have that as the underpinning. You know, and I think an interesting thing, and I'm not sure, right, because I wasn't in the meetings, right, with the Avis, we're number two, we try harder. The happy accident was we try harder than three, four, and five, because I read, a, but really people took it to them going against Hertz, but it was truism. And even, um, I, I have to applaud what Domino's Pizza did in the last 10 years, right? People would, they had focus groups and people like, your pizza tastes like cardboard. They made commercials around really talking about people like and said, we're going to do better and try harder. And I, I, you know, Domino stock people like Domino stock is better than like Apple and Google in the last 10 years, something crazy, but, but they embraced truly who they were. And really they, they wanted to be better. Plus they've done also some really amazing, like they have, even though, you know, I make fun of technology a little bit, they have like hot spots that you can get a pizza delivered to the beach if you want, right? You don't have to be at home. So it's like thinking outside the box for clients too. And someone like Domino's, not always, not every client, but it's like, what else can you do, right? I, I've, I've always told my teams, okay, the client asked for X, we give them X. Let's come back with Y and Z and say, you could add this to what you're doing and Sometimes they do it and sometimes they don't, but it gives them things to think about. Um, you know, Henry and I are both both teachers. He's done some uh, work with uh, the Miami Ad Club, right, Henry? Ad, some other places. Miami Ad School and the Miami University School. of Miami. Yeah, and I do workshops for the ANA and I do my private workshops and um, around that. You're in the trenches every day, you know, as an instructor or not every, maybe not every day, but regularly, weekly. Yeah. I'm curious to hear, and you started alluding to this earlier, what are, what are some of the reactions of your students to what you do on LinkedIn? I mean, are they, have they grown more curious about advertising history, or do they live within five minutes of what they know? Um, I have a few students who, listen, you want to follow me, you want to follow me. I, I have a student who has learned more from the daily postings and the other classes that he's taken, right? It's it's part of it is learning and looking and looking at what's been done, right? You know, Quentin Tarantino, one of the greatest directors in the world, he never went to film school. He worked in a video store, but he watched the greatest movies ever made over and over again. He didn't watch the shitty movies, right? So if you look at great ads, right? Um, and 
I, as a student, I gravitated to award show books. I don't know why I did. And just, re you know, reading Luke Sullivan's book, when Luke Sullivan started, right, his book, famous book, Hey, Whipple, Squeeze This. When he first started, his boss said, I want you to look at all these. I want you to know them, but you can't copy them, right? They're good to know. You get so much learning from a line. And, you know, my partner and I, years ago, we developed, there were in really like six or seven ways to do a movie. I, I'm not a movie guy, but we've come up with 12 ways to do an ad. So there's not one right way. There's not one wrong way. Um, and we give an example, and you're free to use this example in your for your students. I use this with clients. You could just say, this is my friend Greg's Benedict example. But day one, I write on the board, two plus two equals. And I say, well, what's the answer? I don't think I'm trying to fool them. I'm like, please, someone give me an answer. And I always hear four really quietly. I hear four. Yes, two plus two is four. I would even buy 22 as an answer because you're putting two twos together. And if you showed me a little girl in a ballerina outfit, a tutu, I'd be like, that's a winner. <laughs> but what we do as creative problem solvers, and I tell my class, that's what we do. We're creative problem solvers. I write the other side of the equation on the board. I write blank plus blank equals four. And I say, solve it. Put down an answer. We're going to go around the room. And I swear it always starts the same way. Someone has three plus one. Someone has four plus zero. Someone has zero plus four. Someone said I had one plus three. And someone says something like 10 plus negative six. And someone will say, you're allowed to do that? I just told you to solve the problem. Well, the minute you get out of the, the thing, oh, then we get two and a half and one and a half, and we get 3.5 plus 0.5. You know, I can't argue with two plus two is four, but that's an average, right? When we're doing ads as creative problem solvers, drink water, it's refreshing. I can't argue with that, but that's two plus two is four, right? Yeah, so, that's like the lowest common denominator. Kind of. So, and, and all the ex examples, the three, you know, those are good. And then I challenge the class. I'm like, do something that doesn't require math, anything mathematical. And in every class, someone comes up with F-O plus U-R. And that's friggin' genius. <laughs> that's friggin' genius. Or someone else in another class came up with this plus this is four, right? The two shapes. Wow. And that's a great answer, right? And you're looking to be great. You're looking, your book needs to be great. And it's simple, right? It's like talk tick. You can't, we had... We had a double PhD from MIT in our class who wanted to be in advertising. And as my partner said, he was probably smarter in kindergarten than I ever was my whole life. <laughs> so the next week he comes in and said, could I borrow your chalk? Sure. He writes on the board, I wish I took a picture of it. It was like something out of the movie, A Beautiful Mind. <laughs> I'm a math guy. I took calculus. I saw symbols I never saw in my life. And he's writing, 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 writing. He's writing for 10 minutes. And he writes equals four. <laughs> and my and my partner says, wrong. He's like, it's not wrong. I checked it with three of my friends around the world. My partner's like, no, it's wrong that if only 0.00001% is going to get it, right? It's got to be the right answer, but it's got to be simple. Universal. That was a great example for the whole class. Like, you, you can't make it too complicated. Right. And that's what we do is create problem solves. And it's hard, right? Your brain hurts trying to solve the, the equation as equal as you can. You, you bring up an interesting point regarding problem solving. And, and people smarter than me have said that really a great brief is one that articulates the problem clearly and, and then allows the creative problem solvers to come up with the, the solution. And, and I think that example you just gave is, is really a good visualization of that. The, the, the thing for brief writers, for people like me, I'm a strategist, uh, is to, to really find out what's the real problem going on here. Because the clients generally have their vision of what the problem is, and it's usually linked to some 
business metric or something. And that's not the real problem. That's not the problem with consumers. And to your point with the Domino's example, um, I think that was Crispin and Porter's work when yeah. they started doing the the, the focus uh, group stuff was, you know what? You as a brand have this vision of what your brand is about. But the truth is, who owns the brand is consumers. And if they think your pizza tastes like cardboard, it tastes like cardboard. So the only way you're going to change that is to have people believe that their peers and colleagues don't believe it tastes like cardboard. And so how are we going to do that? How are we going to surprise people into, into changing their their opinion about this brand. So I, I'm, I'm, I, I really like what I'm hearing in terms of that example of like the, the using an equation as an example of a, of a problem to solve. And that there's a lot of asymmetrical kind of not direct ways of, of solving it, but that are super clever that everybody gets like the idea of the, you know, the two parts yeah. of the four, right. That's something that anybody could get, but it's not the first thing you think of and that's kind of what makes it that inside joke of like ah i see what they got i see what and, they mean there. and greg i am going to steal that like you wouldn't believe from my workshops because one of the one of the issues the biggest issue that i face and henry and i have talked about this before and when i do my training is marketers who simply come to the creative department and tell them what to do turn them into order takers because they think they know how to solve problems they're they're you know you know mark ritson had an article in in marketing week, I think it was just yesterday, where he essentially rips a new one for marketers because he says, let's be let's be honest here. You ask us to when you brief us, you don't even you marketers don't even know what strategy is. You can't even tell us what the strategy is. I get this all the time. Creatives say, I, I want direction, but I get solutions. They solve try to solve things for me. And this is a this is a your little exercise with the equation is a great way to demonstrate who can solve problems and who can't. I love it. And it's funny that I use that because people ask me, could anyone do advertising? And I love my mom. She's up there. Uh, <laughs> she couldn't do it because she would only say there would be only three answers to that. Two plus two, three plus one, four plus zero. Yeah. Okay. So if you can't, th right, if you could think beyond that, you could do this thing called advertising and be a problem solver. But my mother, th there's no other answer. She would have said that. That's it. There's no other. Um, yeah. Yeah. Right. And and also, right, you know, and going back to the first part of that, right, two plus two is not five, right? It's got to be right. And there are a great many ways, right? There's infinite ways to solve a problem from average to great. And with clients, right, where do you want to be with that? You know, there's the talking to my students, not our rules, the rules of Madison Avenue, your book needs to be great, right? Everything's got to be great. Yes, there are marketers that, you know, this plus that might be a little, there's, that might be a little too clever, but give me two and a half plus one and a half, right? Give me that. I don't want two plus two, but I don't want the, you know, and it's always, it's always easier to pull back. It's always harder to sort of yeah. get out there. Right. Um, like I remember uh, more than 20 years ago, my my the agency I was with, they they part of the campaign and it had a nun in the campaign. And back then the client said, I know I'm going to get in trouble, but let's run the nun. You know, there was like five or six print ads. One was a nun ad. Well, they run this nun ad. A thousand letters, nine hundred and ninety nine. You're going to hell. You're going to this. You would never do it if it was a rabbi. Just unbelievable. And one from a Catholic university saying, we love it. Can we have a copy of this? We want to hang it up in the. <laughs> right. But clients wouldn't do it, right? There's a lot of clients scared now to just sort of, you know, you know, uh, you know, there's a lot yeah. of clients scared for their jobs. They're scared what social media would say. Um, uh, and it's an interesting phenomenon because it's it's always been around a little bit, right? Like people would used to call in, right? They would call the company and say, I can't believe you did this. And the question is, do you want your brand to be held captive by like the most, you know, these are people that are out there looking to be offended, right? Like there's, you know, just like there's people that are professional sweepstakes players, right? Like the, there are people that are just professional complainers yeah no I, you know the 
internet and and the political client yes it's crazy when a brand gets involved that's a whole bigger issue about uh, you know and then there are petitions we're not going to eat at so and so because they support this it it's well you know greg let me let me bring you back to the creative brief because that's that's our ballywick not exclusively but you know henry and i love to talk about it and that's how we got started do you recall, if I'm, if I'm putting you on the spot here, I apologize, but do you recall in your long career a particular creative brief that you absolutely loved or you absolutely hated? They're probably more of the hated than the loved. Um, and what was it about the brief, if you remember it? You know, I remember, you know, just funny, one of these things, we we were, one, you know, you have like a four-hour meeting, which like you, you can't even remember. It was for some insurance company of a brand that I, I never heard of and here's was the hours all morning long right from breakfast through lunch and we all go into the creative director's office he's like we're gonna have a regroup in my office there are like three teams and he said kind of in his own way forget about everything we just heard it's insurance life insurance go do ads for life insurance like because it was just, it got so complicated. I remember whatever it was. Um, I'm trying to think if I've had any great briefs. I, I can't recall any. I'm sure I have. I'm sure I have. You know, it's. But they're so few and far between. They're few and far between. Um, I think, you know, when I tell my students, they're like, you know, because we just give them an assignment and we talk about, but it's like, you know, when you're looking through an annual, I don't know what the brief was. I know it's a great ad. I don't know what they were trying to call. And, you know, I don't care what, what, how many products they sold. There was a great ad for BMW motorcycles. I posted it in my series and I'm going to, I hope I get the, the headline right. It was Germans can sit through five hours, five hour operas by Wagner. They obviously know something about endurance. Yes. Yes. I remember. I, Look at that ad. My spidey sense tingles. I never once thought how many motorcycles did they sell. I don't really care as a creative person at some point, right? The same way an actor or, right, I, I look at someone's role on TV. Haley Berry won the Academy Award for Monster or Monster's Ball, I think. Yeah, Monster's Ball. I never thought how much money did the movie make. I don't, it's not my she doesn't care about that she did her you know and when you're being a creative in the trenches you got to do a great ad you're not worried about moving product i think i think that as a brief writer we should have some sort of hippocratic oath which is you know first do no harm right <laughs> like the, the brief the brief at the bare minimum shouldn't convolute the issue and make it more complicated for the creatives like right. it should strip down the problem and articulate it. And if nobody remembers the brief, that's okay. As long as it was clear and work was able to be developed from it, that, that was good work. Um, and I think that, that there is an issue. I think sometimes you want as a brief writer, the brief to be great. You, but I, I talk about sound strategy, spectacular, creative, the, the strategy itself should never be fancier than than the work. Um, so, uh, you know, thinking about and hearing you talking, I just kind of came up with that idea of, you know, what what doctors do, which is first, let me not harm the patient. Like, let me not do anything that's going to be destructive to the creative process. And uh, I think that's a good kind of place for a brief writer to start. And, and I would add to that by saying, because I've I posted this on on LinkedIn, the brief is just meant to kind of give the creatives a shove. So it's a spark, it's not the flame. Trust the creatives to, to, to produce right, the big also, idea. You know, and I tell people, and I like, people don't like, but I like thinking outside the box. I'm sorry, I like that phrase. I think people think it's overused. But with a brief, you almost have to think inside the box, right? Here, it, here are the parameters. You have to think here. And, you know, I've, along my career, and I remember, I, I can't think of a specific instance, but I remember being in a meeting and both the creative and the head of camp loved the campaign. It was off brief. They're like, we're going to get the client to change the brief now because this was like a new way to think about, you know, solving the problem, which happens sometimes as well. Uh, yeah. I, I, Howard and I have had this conversation many times as, 
as a strategist, you have to be humble, right? Like you think you know what the strategy is and you articulate it, but the creative process is an organic and iterative one. So when you're hearing the ideas, suddenly there's a whole new vein of thinking that the creatives tapped into that you hadn't been tuned into. And you have to have your antennas up and say, you know what? Forget what I told you before. This is really brilliant. This is really insightful. We right. can do a whole stream of ideation just around this uh, as a new starting point. And 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 I think that I think that that's a a, a great point. You know, Greg, Greg one of the exercise one exercise that I do with my workshop folks that you might consider doing with your students, assuming yes. that you don't do it already. Um, but when you're working with creatives, is you're looking at great ads. You don't know what the creative brief is. Right. Ask, your, ask your students to see if they can figure out what the creative brief might have been. Do a reverse engineering exercise. It really helps people think about who is this ad talking to? What are they trying to say? Can I figure out an insight? What's the one thing that I want to take away? It really helps focus the mind. And it's a great exercise because I think you would agree, and Henry and I talk about this, creatives need to be involved in writing a brief. They can't just sit around waiting for the brief to show up. They have skin in the game. They should be involved. And Henry talks a great deal about how he collaborates with his senior creative leaders to get buy off on that. So I, I think that's a great exercise. I just call it reverse engineering. Right. And then you get the client to buy off on it because then we're, you're all on the same page. You're solving the blank plus blank is four. Or the client's like, okay, yeah. I don't like four and make it 10. And so, right. It's so you're on the same page. So you're not showing them something like, what is this? Precisely. Right. Precisely. So, uh, how long do you think you can keep this going? You got you got a, a chock full of a, a portfolio full of uh, of ads that you just want to keep sharing with us. Uh, I how how long is my oh brilliant advertising? Yeah, yeah. I think it's end, I think it's going to a thousand. That's great. So I'm at about two ninety now, and and I don't know why. Also, I do it in I don't know if the Super Bowl was going. I don't know because the Super Bowl does things in Roman numerals. So I've been doing it in Roman numerals. <laughs> Which a couple of times I've made a mistake and someone sends me a note or I have to go to Google like, you know, how do you do 287? And, you know, some of them are a little hard with the, with the, with the X before the C and the... Um, so you're learning a new language. I'm learning a new language. Um, well, well, Greg, we really are excited about the ads to come. And we look forward, you, you've shared with us that you've got a long way to go. The number of, if you can come up with a thousand ads, we're all we're going to be eagerly awaiting all of them, and we really appreciate you joining us today on the Brief Brothers. Thank you so much. Thank right. you. Thanks for having me. Good stuff, Henry. Good stuff, Howard. He's Henry Gomez, and he's Howard Ibach, and together we're the Brief Brothers. Till next time. Bye bye.